you. It's a, an honor to be here. Uh, I've never actually even been to Oxford before, let alone spoken here. And uh, needless to say, it's a great honor to be on the stage with uh, my friend and colleague and actually one of my intellectual heroes, Richard Dawkins. So as many of you know, we have spent the last several years publicly criticizing religion and I can tell you that what you, you hear back when you do that are all the reasons why most people think that's a terrible thing to do. And the reasons are not so numerous. It turns out there's not a hundred ways or reasons to rise to the defense of God. There really are only three. Either you argue that a specific religion is true, or you argue religion is useful in general, or you argue that atheism is, is intolerant or in bad taste or, or corrosive of something that's important in human life. And it's interesting that people rarely argue for the truth of religion. Even fundamentalists, I find. Fundamentalists uh, almost never come forward with evidence for miracles or the confirmation of biblical prophecy. Some do, but for the most part, that's not even their primary concern. Rather, it's, it's the usefulness of religion especially as a, a framework in which to think about morality uh, that people uh, uh, are uh, willing to advocate for uh, and the commensurate danger of, of atheism, that atheism is somehow corrosive of, of morality. Uh, now the first thing to notice is that as, a, as an argument for belief in God, that is it's not only a bad argument, that's actually a, a non sequitur. I mean, religion could be useful, but completely empty of, of uh, content. Uh, it could function like a placebo. Uh, and beliefs, really, you can't, you can't believe something or shouldn't be able to believe something merely based on its utility. Uh, beliefs are not like clothing. You can't adopt them on the basis of, of uh, comfort or utility. Uh, but people of faith, uh, really to a man, are worried that unless we have a, a universal moral framework, unless we have a sense that words like good and evil and right and wrong actually mean something, then humanity will, will lose its way. And I, and I actually share that fear. Uh, and I should point out that not all atheists do, but I, I, I do. And I, I, I want to tell you when this, this concern was first seared onto my brain. I was at a, um, a meeting at the Salk Institute. I believe it might have been one that Richard w was at as well. Uh, and I gave a talk about morality, and I, and I argued, as I, I will uh, here tonight, that morality must relate at some level to questions of human and animal well-being. And the moment we admit this, we can see that certain moral codes are, in fact, worse than others. Uh, and I cited as an example the misogyny and sadism of the Taliban as, as an example of a, 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 an orientation that was obviously less good than others. And at the end, another invited speaker approached me and said, how could you ever say, from the point of view of science, that forcing women to wear burqas is wrong? And I said, well, because the moment you admit right and wrong has something to do with, with human well-being, then it's obvious that, that forcing half the population to live in cloth bags and beating them or killing them when they try to get out is, is not a, a good way of maximizing it. And she said, well, well that's just your opinion. And I said, okay, well, let's make it easier. Let's say we found a culture that was removing the eyeballs of children, every third child, say. Would, would, you, would you then agree that we'd found a culture that was not perfectly maximizing human well-being? And she said, well, it would depend on why they were doing it. <laughs> uh, and uh, so af after my eyebrows returned from the back of my head, uh, I said, Okay, let's say they're doing it for religious reasons. Let's say they have a scripture which says every third should walk in darkness or some such nonsense. And she said, well, then you could never say that they were wrong. Now, you should know that I was speaking to a woman who was uh, quite a uh, sophisticated student of philosophy and science. In fact, she, she has since been appointed to the President's Council on Bioethics in the United States. She's one of 13 people advising President Obama on all of the ethical implications of, of medicine uh, and progress in, in related science and technology. 
and she had just delivered a perfectly lucid lecture on the moral implications of advances in neuroscience, and she was especially concerned that we might be subjecting captured terrorists to fMRI-based lie detection technology, and she thought, she, she thought this would be a, a, a truly unconscionable violation of their, their cognitive liberty. Uh, so on the one hand, her, her moral scruples were really finely calibrated to, to recoil from the slightest perceived misstep in our uh, war on terror, and yet she was totally detached from the very real suffering of millions of women in Afghanistan at this moment. So I view this double standard as a problem. And strangely, this is the erosion of basic common sense and moral goodness that religious people tend to be worried about. Uh, now, I, I hope it's obvious to all of you and will be even more obvious at the end of this hour that, that religion isn't the answer to this problem. Uh, but um, it's inconvenient that the people who tend to uh, agree with me about the necessity of a, a concept of moral truth are, by and large, religious demagogues and not our fellow secularists, uh, and certainly not our uh, uh, atheists. So now, how do we find ourselves into this, in this situation. How, do we, how is it that, that religious dogmatists and many, many scientifically orient, oriented uh, secularists agree about the limits of science? Well, it's thought that there, there are two quantities in this world. There are facts on the one hand, and there are values on the other. Uh, and it's imagined that these two are, di are discrete entities that, that can't be understood uh, uh, in monistic terms, and uh, it's imagined that science can't say anything about value. Science can't tell us uh, the answers to the most important questions in human life. How should we raise our children? What constitutes a good life? Uh, in principle, science can't touch these things. Uh, of course, everyone agrees that science can help us get what we value. I mean, once we agree that we value something, then science is a very useful tool. Uh, but it, can, it can't tell us what we ought to value. Uh, and so it's, it's thought from the, the point of view of science that when we look at the universe, we just see one event following another. We just see uh, a concatenation of causes. And there's no corner of the universe that, uh, that announces certain events as good or bad or right or wrong. Uh, we make those judgments. But in, in doing that, we seem to be broadcasting our preferences onto a, a reality that is intrinsically value-free. And where do our preferences come from? Where do our notions of right and wrong and, and good and evil come from? Well, they, they clearly are the product of apish impulses and social emotions that have been drummed into us by evolution. And then they get modulated by culture. So you take something like sexual jealousy, for instance. Uh, we, we come from a long line of, of primate ancestors that were probably quite covetous of one another. Uh, despite the fact that everyone was covered with hair. Uh, and this, gets, this, this possessiveness gets modulated by culture, and so we have something like the institution of marriage, say. Uh, and therefore, from the point of view of science, when you look at a statement like, it's wrong to cheat on your spouse, it seems like that statement doesn't really track reality in any deep sense. There's nothing, this is just how apes like us learn to, to worry when we, when we acquire language. Uh, it's just conventionally wrong. It can't be really wrong from the point of view of science. This is just an, an improvisation we're, we're doing on the back of biology. Uh, now, this is where religious people begin to get a little queasy, and, and I think they should. Uh, but they see no alternative, by and large, but to insert the God of Abraham into the clockwork as an invisible arbiter of moral truth. So, it, so it's wrong to cheat on your spouse because Yahweh deems that it is so, which is rather odd because in other moods, Yahweh is fond of genocide and slavery and, and human sacrifice. Now, I'm going to argue that this split between facts and values is an illusion. And my claim is that, that values are a certain kind of fact. They're facts about the well-being of conscious creatures. There are facts about the, the kinds of experiences it's possible to have in this universe. Now, in, in claiming that value is reduced to the well-being of conscious creatures, I've been, I'm introducing two concepts, consciousness and well-being. Let's start with consciousness. This, this 
to my eye, is not at all an arbitrary starting point. Okay, imagine a universe without the possibility of consciousness. Imagine a universe just filled with rocks. Okay, there's, there's nothing that it's like to be in this universe. Okay, the lights are not on in this universe. There's clearly no happiness or suffering. I would argue there's a, the, the concept of right and wrong, good and evil, simply doesn't apply. For, for changes in the universe to matter, they have to matter at least potentially to some conscious system. Now, what about well-being? It seems like the well-being of conscious creatures could be a, a controversial anchor for morality, but I don't think it should. Okay, here's the only assumption you need to make. Imagine a universe where, where every conscious creature suffers as much as it possibly can for as long as it can. I call this the worst possible misery for everyone. The worst possible misery for everyone is bad. If the word bad is going to mean anything, surely it applies to the worst possible misery for everyone. Now, if you think the worst possible misery for everyone isn't bad, or that it might have a silver lining, or it, there might be something worse, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and what is more, I'm reasonably sure you don't know what you're talking about either. The moment you admit this, the moment you admit that the worst possible misery for everyone is the worst outcome, okay, then you have to admit that every other possible experience is better than the worst possible misery for everyone. So a continuum opens up. And because the experience of conscious creatures is going to depend in some way on the laws of nature, there are going to be right and wrong ways to move across this continuum. It will be possible to think you're avoiding the worst possible misery for everyone and to be wrong about that and to fail to avoid it. This is, in some sense, a navigation problem. Uh, so here is my argument for, for locating moral truth in the context of science. Okay, questions of right and wrong and good and evil depend upon minds. Okay, they depend upon the possibility of experience. Minds are natural phenomena. They, d they depend upon the laws of nature in some way. Morality and human values, therefore, can be understood potentially in the context of science because in talking about these things, we really are talking about all of the facts that relate to the well-being of conscious creatures. In our case, we're talking about genetics and neurobiology and psychology and sociology and economics. Now, I, I view this space of all possible experience as a kind of moral landscape where the peaks correspond to the heights of well-being, and the valleys correspond to the lowest depths of suffering. And one thing that to, to, to drop out of this analogy is the possibility of there being multiple peaks. Maybe there are, are many different but morally equivalent ways for, for, in our case, human beings to thrive. But clearly there are many more ways not to thrive. There will be many more ways to not be on a peak. And I think it's rather obvious that there are many more ways to suffer unnecessarily in this world than to be sublimely happy. Now, the Taliban are still my favorite example of a group of people who are struggling mightily to build a society that is obviously less good than others on offer. The average lifespan for women in Afghanistan is 44 years. Okay, they have a, a literacy rate of 12 percent. They have almost the highest fertility rate in the world and almost the highest infant and maternal mortality in the world. This is one of the best places on earth to watch women and infants die. They also have a GDP that's lower than the world average in the year 1820. So it seems to me patently obvious that the optimal response to this situation, which is to say the most moral response, is not to throw battery acid in the faces of little girls for the crime of learning to read. Now, I think this is common sense to everyone in this room, and common sense it should be to everyone in the civilized world, except you, if you happen to be a bioethicist working on the President's Council at the moment. Uh, but this is also of necessity a claim about biology and psychology and sociology and economics. It, it is not unscientific to say that the Taliban are wrong about morality. In fact, we have to say this the moment we admit we know anything at all about human well-being. Now, some people with a little philosophical training may begin to wonder, well, who's to say that if 
a father wants to bur burn his daughter's face off with battery acid, he's wrong in any objective sense. Okay, who's to say we should value the well-being of little girls? Who's to say that the father doesn't have a, an alternate but also legitimate conception of well-being? Now, moral skeptics of this kind invariably cite David Hume's famous distinction between is and ought. You, the, the notion is you can't get an ought from an is, which is to say that science can only give us a descriptive account of the way the world is, and there's no way to move from that account to an account of how the world ought to be. Now, I, I happen to think this is a trick of language. This notion of ought this, this falls very much into Wittgenstein's notion of philosophy as a battle against the bewitchment of our intelligence by means of language. And, and people are mightily bewitched by words like ought and should and, and moral duty. Now, to, to ask whether we ought to avoid the worst possible misery for everyone, on my view, is nonsensical. If, if we ought to do anything, if we should do anything, if we have a moral duty to do anything in this universe, it's to avoid the worst possible misery for everyone. Okay, there's no notion of ought that reaches deeper than the imperative of avoiding the worst possible misery for everyone. Okay, it, it's not, it doesn't make sense to say, well, I would have avoided the worst possible misery for everyone, but I actually had other priorities. Okay, there, there, there's no space for those other priorities to occupy. Or so I argue. Now, many people imagine on Hume's account that science is bound to be merely descriptive, and therefore one person's values can only trump another person's values by, by seeking consensus. There's no, you, all you have are, are differing opinions. And, there, and all such opinions are in principle on par. But this isn't true. There are many ways for my values to be wrong. Uh, but they can be wrong with respect to deeper values that I hold, or would hold if I were only a deeper person. They, my, my values can be objectively bad guides to finding happiness in this world. I can value things that will reliably make me miserable or make those I love miserable. So, so things can be right or wrong independent of a person's current values. Now, some of you might worry that I haven't defined well-being with sufficient precision. How can, how can this loose concept be uh, the ground out of which we talk about moral truth? Well, consider by analogy the notion of physical health. Okay. Physical health is very difficult to define. And, and, it, and its, its definition seems to always be con only contextually true. I mean, now physical health is you can expect to live to be 85, 90 without Alzheimer's. Uh, 100 years ago, you could expect to live to the ripe old age of 40 or 50. Okay. It changes, and it could change uh, to a great degree in the future. The, what does health mean? So it has something to do with not always vomiting. It has something to do with not being in excruciating pain. And this is, these are very loose uh, criteria for health. And yet this does not make the concept of health vacuous at all. It certainly doesn't make it merely the product of culture or merely the product of, of personal whim. And no, notice that no one ever attacks the philosophical underpinnings of medicine with questions like, well, who are you to say that not always vomiting is healthy? You know, what if you meet someone who wants to vomit? <laughs> what if you meet someone who wants to vomit until he dies? How would you argue that he's not as healthy as you are? Okay, the, yes, the very notion of health contains certain values. This does not make medicine unscientific. Okay, and, I, and I would argue that in talking about morality, we are actually talking about psychological health and the health of societies. The truth of this, this fact value uh, issue actually reaches deeper than that because science has always been in the values business. We simply cannot speak about facts without embracing certain values. It's not, it's not that you can't get an ought from an is. You can't get an is without embracing certain oughts. And consider the simplest statement of scientific fact. Water is two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. Okay, this, this seems to be as value-free an utterance as human beings ever make. Okay, but what do we do when someone doubts the truth of this proposition? What if, what if someone comes forward and says, well, I'm sorry, but that's not how I choose to think about water. <laughs>
What if someone says, I'm a biblical chemist and I read in Genesis 1 that God created water before he created light, which in fact it says in Genesis 1. So therefore there were no stars to fuse hydrogen and helium into heavier elements like oxygen. So there would have been no oxygen to put in the water. So God either made, either there's no oxygen in water or God made special oxygen. And I don't, I don't believe he'd do that because that would be biblically inelegant. What, what could we possibly do with such a person? Okay. All we can do is appeal to scientific values. Okay. And if, if a person doesn't share those values, the conversation is over. Okay. We, we, we must appeal to the value of understanding the world, the value of evidence, in this case, some hundreds of years of, of evidence in chemistry, the value of logical consistency. Much of what we believe about the world is predicated on the validity of our beliefs about the structure of water. If someone doesn't value evidence, what evidence are you going to provide that proves they should value it? If someone doesn't value logic, what logical argument could you invoke to prove that they should value logic? And I think the split between facts and values should just look bizarre on its face. Because what are we really saying when we say that science can't be applied to the most important questions in human life. We're saying that, that when we really relinquish our biases, when we make every effort to get behind our wishful thinking and self-deception, when we rely most clearly on honest observation and, and sound reasoning, when, when intellectual honesty is at its peak, well then, that has no application whatsoever to the most important questions in human life. That's precisely the mood you cannot be in to answer the most important questions in human life. So I'd argue to you that, that thinking of moral truth in the context of science, and indeed a science of morality, should only pose a problem for you if you think a science of morality must be absolutely self-justifying in a way that no branch of science can be. Okay, so science of morality based on a concern for well-being would be on the same footing as, as, as a science of medicine based on a concern for health, or indeed any other science that has to assume certain axiomatic assumptions. There are many questions you could ask that are, that are, are actually good questions. Uh, one would be, how would this work in practice? I mean, they, they, we, we, can, we often have values, that, genuine values, that can be in competition with one another, can be trade-offs between values. How do we balance one person's well-being against the well-being of the group? How do we evaluate the consequences of, of our actions when the consequences seem to go on forever? So you take, for instance, the, this recent tragedy in Japan. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it certainly seems bad, but what if this causes us to handle nuclear materials so much more conscientiously than we ever would have in the future that it winds up saving millions of lives. Okay, then these are all good questions, but I would argue these are, are not a retort to the argument I've given you. Okay, it, it could be difficult or impossible to answer some of these questions, but in every area of science, in every area where we acknowledge that truth claims are valid, there are an infinite number of questions that are indeed difficult or impossible to answer. This does not nullify truth claims. I mean, this is my favorite example of the moment is how many birds are in flight over the surface of the earth. Okay, we don't know, we can't know, we will never know, and in, in fact it just changed. Okay, there's, there's no scientific effort that could deliver those data. And yet we know there's a, there's a simple answer, it's, it's just an integer. This could well be true of certain questions about morality. This would not uh, nullify the, the, the reality of, of moral truth. So in, in closing, I just want to remind you of why religion can't be the answer to the question of moral truth. Well, first, there's just the simple fact that all of our scriptures were written by people who, by virtue of their placement in history, had less access to scientific knowledge and what is now basic common sense than any person in this room. In fact, there's not a person in this room who has ever met a person whose worldview is as narrow as the worldview of Abraham or Moses or Jesus or Muhammad. This is, these people knew nothing, next to nothing, that is now, of the facts that are now relevant to us.
in the 21st century. They knew nothing about the, the origins of life, the relationship between mind and brain. They didn't know that mental illness was a, a, even a category of human suffering. They knew nothing about DNA or viruses or computation or electricity. Uh, none of this is in Scripture. Okay, they, they had no idea why people got sick and died. I mean, unless, unless you saw someone stabbed with a spear, you had no idea why they died. And in moral terms, with, with a few notable exceptions, most of these people were no wiser than, than your average Afghan warlord today. Okay, they had absolute, the most had absolutely no notion that slavery was problematic, that, that it was, there was something morally unsavory about owning people and treating them like farm equipment. Okay, Jesus and his apostles couldn't see that slavery was worth condemning. In closing, I just want to suggest to you that just as we don't have Christian physics, though the Christians invented physics, and we don't have Muslim algebra, though the Muslims invented algebra, we at some point will not have Christian and Muslim morality. Okay, the, the truth has to float free of these uh, uh, provincial ideas. What, what remains for us to discover are all the facts that relate to genuine questions of human well-being. And, and the goal, clearly, is to build a global civilization based on shared values. Now, it seems to me the only tool we need to do that is honest and open inquiry. And if faith is ever right about anything in this space, it's just right by accident. Thank you very much. I want to begin by plugging a book. Those of you who've read Sam's previous books, uh, The End of Faith and Letter to a Christian Nation, um, will know how beautifully he writes. And I just want to begin by um, illustrating it from the new book. I just want to read a couple of paragraphs. Oh, sure. The current head of the NIH, that's Francis Collins, recommends that we, that, that's the Na National Institutes of Health in America, recommends that we believe the following propositions. One, Jesus Christ, a carpenter by trade, was born of a virgin, ritually murdered as a scapegoat for the collective sins of his species, and then resurrected from death after an interval of three days. Two, he promptly ascended bodily to heaven, where for two millennia he has eavesdropped upon, and on occasion even answered, the simultaneous prayers of billions of beleaguered human beings. Three, not content to maintain this numinous arrangement indefinitely, this invisible carpenter will one day return to Earth to judge humanity for its sexual indiscretions and sceptical doubts, at which time he will grant immortality to anyone who has had the good fortune to be convinced on mother's knee that this baffling litany of miracles is the most important series of truths ever revealed about the cosmos. Four, Every other member of our species, past and present, from Cleopatra to Einstein, no matter what his or her terrestrial accomplishments, will be consigned to a far less desirable fate, best left unspecified. Five, in the meantime, God, Jesus, may or may not intervene in our world as he pleases, curing the occasional end-stage cancer or not, answering an especially earnest prayer for guidance or not, consoling the bereaved or not through his perfectly wise and loving agency. Just how many scientific laws would be violated by this scheme? One is tempted to say all of them. And yet judging from the way that journals like Nature have treated Collins, one can only conclude that there is nothing in the scientific worldview or in the intellectual rigor and self-criticism that gave rise to it that casts these convictions in an unfavorable light. Well, there's a lot like that in the book, which I hope is enough to recommend it, but... <laughs> Sam, you began by talking about utility of belief, and um, people who say that religion is useful, has, mm. a, has a utility, because it somehow gives us a moral, a moral compass. And you, you, you quoted religious people who say that, and of course they do. But I think what disturbs me more, and I wonder whether you agree, is those non-religious people 
who say something like, of course, you and I don't need religion, we don't right. need religion, right. but the riffraff out there do. I mean, um, that is at best condescending. Yeah, it, it's, it's profoundly condescending and, and also quite cynical and unimaginative. It, it, it's as though those purposes can't be served any other way and will never be served any other way. It's just, it's, it's, uh, it closes the horizons of human collaboration and creativity in a way that it just seems truly bizarre. Uh, so well, yeah, it's, 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 an, it's, an, it's not a well thought out position on the part of our fellow secularists. I, I sense that you, in a way you make life easy for yourself by uh, concentrating on the truly appalling things like the Taliban uh, and, uh, well, I remember a few years ago, I think in this very room, listening to the psychologist Nicholas Humphrey giving a beautiful lecture called What Shall We Tell the Children? And he spoke about uh, a girl who archaeological evidence shows was sacrificed, I think, to the sun god in Peru, uh, I think a, a few centuries ago. And he quoted anthropologists who speculated that this girl was no doubt looking forward to being sacrificed, the great honor it was to her to be, to be sacrificed. And, and Humphrey was quoting the same kind of moral relativists as you, you've been quoting. And he then got spectacularly and movingly angry. How dare these anthropologists say such, such things? How dare we, listening to documentaries on our televisions about things, get a sort of warm, glowy feeling about this girl fulfilling her ambitions because of her religious uh, be belief. Do, do you happen to know that? The history of human sacrifice is truly amazing to com contemplate. There, there's a book uh, entitled Human Sacrifice by uh, last name Davies. Uh, I actually cite it in, in my afterword to Letter to a Christian Nation, which is on my website. Uh, but it's, it's astonishing that, that almost any culture you could name had a tradition of human sacrifice. And I actually don't doubt that people went willingly and eagerly to, to their deaths. Because if you have the requisite beliefs, it makes sense. It was, it was believed that you could, you could engage this one-way dialogue with the ancestors by just going to meet them. Uh, uh, you could cure the king of his venereal disease and, and uh, save all the people you love from, from the wrath of God by, by uh, uh, being sacrificed. Now, of course, other people were, were sacrificed involuntarily as well, but... Uh, one of the, the embarrassing things about Christianity is it actually it, it, it stands astride this truly contemptible history, not as a, any kind of departure from it. I mean, Christianity is not a religion that rejects human sacrifice. It's a religion that celebrates a single human sacrifice as though it were fully effective. Uh, and people tend to elide this, this kind of bizarre uh, commitment. Um, but uh, to the point of, of making things easy for myself, you're, you're not the first, inevitably, uh, incidentally, to point that out, that I've made things easy for myself. But it's, it's actually, unless you have an argument against the, the, these clear cases, it seems to me you don't have an argument at all for moral relativism. Yes, that's right. I mean, you, yeah. You've got a baseline for your, for your landscape, yeah. but that, so that the peaks can kind of stand out from this baseline that presumably everybody will agree to, yeah, yeah. but you do come up against, and you mention them, of course, both in your talk and, and in your book, the sort of standard problems with utilitarianism. I mean, I, I take it you would describe your philosophy as a, a kind of scientific utilitarianism. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of, uh, or more broadly speaking, consequentialism, but the reason why I don't eagerly answer to that name is that Everyone thinks they know that there's, a, there's just a, an obvious stalemate between consequentialism and its rivals, and that that makes sense. And uh, I think it's, it's many of the concepts and many of the distinctions in moral philosophy have prevented us from, from actually thinking about moral truth in the, co in the context of science. So I'm presenting a new argument, and there are many, many aspects of my argument that, that, are, that don't track consequentialism. Um, one of the problems with consequentialism is that people don't think very imaginatively about what counts as a consequence. So you have the, the, the classic trolley problem, uh, 
that many of you have probably heard of. This is, this is ubiquitous now in, in, in moral philosophy and in, in neuroscientific research on morality. You have a train coming down the track, and it's going to hit and kill five workmen who don't see it coming. But you stand at a switch, and you can throw, throw the switch, and the train will take another track, and there it will only kill one workman. And so you, people are asked, you know, should you flip that switch? Now, when asked this, 95% of people say, well, absolutely, you have to flip that switch. You, you save a net four lives. You'd be a moral monster not to, to uh, do that. But you can pose the problem another way. You now stand on a footbridge overlooking the, the trolley track. The trolley's coming down the track, and there's a suitably large person at your side who you can push into the path of the un oncoming trolley, killing him, obviously, but saving a net four lives. And now, posed under this guise, 95% of people say you would be a monster to push that fat man onto the track. Uh, now, I, I happen to think this is somewhat ill-posed because I think we all have an intuitive physics and we burn a fair amount of fuel wondering whether the fat man is really going to stop the trolley. Uh, but even if, you, even if you finesse it and, and make it clear that, that uh, uh, he will, they seem different, these situations. Now, from, a, from the, the usual consequentialist point of view, people say, well, it's the same. You, you just have body count. This is actuarially, this is the same scenario. But maybe it is, in fact, not the same. If it is just fundamentally different to push a person up close and personal to his death than to flip a switch, if, if that difference can never be uh, reformed, then, they, then they, they're not, in fact, the same. If you're going to wake up with nightmares for the rest of your life because you push someone but feel like a hero because you flipped a switch, those are the consequences that have to be uh, built into our analysis, and, and there, there are many ways in which, which traditional, the traditional discussion of these issues uh, breaks down. Uh, so uh, that's Another that. version of that one is the, is the um, uh, hospital, where there's one patient who needs a kidney transplant, another patient needs a heart transplant, another patient needs a lung transplant, another patient needs a liver transplant, and there are no organs available. But then the doctors notice that there's somebody in the waiting room who has a perfectly healthy one of all these things. <laughs> so you can kill one to save, to save four. And it's, it's, it's the same point, that the, the positive act of killing somebody is one that nobody warms to. And, and just, but just imagine if we all lived in a society where at any moment you could be sitting in your doctor's office thinking you're getting a checkup, and you could be <laughs> grabbed and vivisected for the sake of others. This is, we would be, we live in constant terror. Uh, so these are the kinds of consequences you have to think of. And, 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 uh, but again, I, my argument is, if something matters, it has to matter, it has to be amenable to a, a, a discussion of the conscious experience of conscious creatures. And, and so I use well-being as a kind of catch-all for that mattering. If it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. If there, if there, if there are differences, if there are trade-offs uh, in which we all recognize this is a different world, but it's sort of just as good as world A is sort of just as good as world B, but different, well, then it doesn't matter. If there's one slice of pie here, uh, and if I get it or Richard gets it, one the other can't get it, there is a zero-sum uh, uh, opposition here, but how different is a world in which he gets it versus the one I get it? Well, it's, it's, it's different to one of us, but globally speaking, it's not so different. These are, these are, uh, these are issues in which we have to ask whether differences matter or not in some kind of global sense. Now, this doesn't necessarily give us guidance in every traditional moral conundrum, uh, but my argument is that the most important moral decisions are ones in which it's not zero sum. Uh, the, the most important moral decisions are the ones where all boats will start to rise with the same tide. I mean, just ask yourself, how good could human life be? I mean, how, how could we build a global civilization in which the, the maximum number of people truly flourish? Solving that problem is not going to entail working a billion people to death as slaves for all of our enjoyment. I mean, those are the kinds of examples uh, that, that are, are given. We're so deeply social. Our happiness is, is so obviously predicated on the creativity and flourishing of others 
we're not atomized selves where our selfishness can be maintained in opposition to all others. Our, our, the only way to be wisely selfish in this world is to care about others. And when you look at the kinds of things sane people want, like love and friendship and community, I mean, these are, these are intrinsically social and, and non-zero-sum concerns. Another objection that you must meet all the time, I'm guessing, is the, the brave new world um, right. objection. I mean, what if you could spray the whole world with a happiness drug, uh, which, um, which uh, made us feel good all the time and never uneasy, never, never unhappy, but then we'd, we would never, according to the savage in Brave New World, we would never appreciate Hamlet, we'd never appreciate Romeo and Juliet. Um, uh, some people would say that we would lose an enormous amount while nevertheless suffering would increase by possibly your criteria. Yeah, well, I think this is the question of, of how much we want our conscious states and, and emotional life to actually track the reality of our circumstance in the world. And I think we certainly want it to, to, tra to track reality rather closely. Now, the question is whether we want it to perfectly track. That seems to be, I think, open to debate. But clearly, if, you're, if everyone's taking the happiness drug, this is, in, in some basic sense, materially unsustainable. I mean, if you're, if you're just knocked out on the couch in bliss, you know, and your children are starving, or you have no career anymore, I mean, so there, there are obvious consequences to, well, to be... Well, you slanted that again. To, to, I mean, it, it wouldn't have to be well, like that. Well, no, 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 but so, 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 so the question is, it has to track to some degree. You mm -hmm. have, and so then you kind of dial it back from, from the oblivion of... of uh, the, per, the, the perfect drug, and you ask yourself, well, just how happy do you want to be able to be? So let's say we have a, let's say we, we develop a pill that is the perfect antidote to grief. Say, so somebody dies, and you are inconsolable. Let's say your child dies. How, when do you want to take that pill? I mean, do you want to take that pill? What, what, do, what would it mean to take the pill the moment your child dies? Okay, so you know that your, your, your daughter has drowned in the bathtub. You are, come upon the scene, your life is ruined, but then you realize you've got some of these pills in the drawer. So you pop the pill and you don't care. Now, that, that in some sense is, is, is conceivable that that's possible. I mean, that actually could be coming, that kind of development. The question is, uh, what, what are you forsaking? I mean, the, what does it mean to love someone uh, and to be completely inured to the, their death in the very moment of their death. I mean, there's a, so much of what we value in our lives is an actual sensitivity to reality. Now, would you never want to take that pill? I, I, I don't know. It's, it's possible that you know, somebody could just not be grieving so terribly after the death of someone close to them that you would want to take a little bit of the pill. I mean, you would want to take an antidepressant, as we as we do now. Um, that seems to me to be perfectly sane. But there's there's this there's this gray area where the question has to gets interesting, and perhaps we'll never feel that we have the a, a clear cut right answer. But it's clearly not the pill that leaves you just immune to any changes in the world that that are actually relevant to your relationships with those you care about and your understanding of what's going on in the universe. You're facing the classic problems that um, moral philosophers have faced for a long time, and you're well, well aware of them, and you've discussed some of them today, some of them in the book. There's the trolley problem, the problem of how you value human happiness against that of other species, which is in your book, but which you, don't, which you haven't referred to tonight. That's another difficult problem. Problems of um, uh, sacrificing some people for the happiness of others. All, all these are difficult problems which have faced moral philosophers for a very long time. But you appear to be bringing to those problems a new thought, which is that science, as opposed to just philosophic thinking, reasoning, right. uh, could help. Now, moral philosophy is the application of scientific logical reasoning to moral problems. But you are actually, again, you didn't mention it so much in your talk, but in the book, bringing your 
neurobiological expertise to bear, um, which is a sort of a new way of doing it. Can you t tell me a bit about that? Because um, I'm, I'm not quite clear how doing neurophysiology kind of adds to uh, insight right. into these moral right. problems. Well, I actually think that the frontier between science and philosophy actually doesn't exist. I think, I think when we, we don't have, when, it, when a question is not operationalized, when we don't have an experiment we can perform, when we don't uh, know how to get data, then we tend to be talking the talk of philosophy. But the moment, the philosophy is kind of the womb of, of the sciences, and in fact it was physics at one point was called natural philosophy. Uh, the moment something becomes experimentally tractable, then we, it, it, these sciences bud off from, from philosophy. And I think every science has philosophy built into it. So the board, the, 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 there, there is no partition in my mind. Uh, but the relevance of neuroscience is born of the fact that everything we experience, everything we care about, every, every instance of, of something mattering to us, is at bottom a state of our brain. It's, it, so it, it, you can go one better than just asking somebody what makes you happy. Um, you can actually measure their brain waves or, or, or something. And well, yeah, and, and, this, this goes to the, the, the question of you know, whether we will ever have mind-reading machines. And I, I think we, we do have mind-reading machines. They're, they're incredibly primitive now. But with fMRI, you can make judgments about what someone is thinking. Uh, potentially in real time, uh, and, and for, for instance, a graduate student in, in the lab I came from at, at where I did my work at, at UCLA uh, analyzed my uh, data on belief. I did a, 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 a study of, of belief and disbelief, and we just put people in the scanner and had them read statements that were either clearly true or clearly false or, or clearly uh, uh, uncertain, and we just, we just, compa we just looked for the, the, the difference in the brain between between truth and falsity, and, and, and we compared them to both to uncertainty as well. And so I, I published a couple of papers on belief ba based on that, but then someone else came back with a different analysis that was a called a machine learning analysis, where they actually looked to see if they could just, based, based on the raw data, determine whether a person believed something or not in any given trial. So on, you know, on question number 75, did this person believe it to be true or false, and they could detect that with 95% accuracy. Uh, and there have been many other experiments that, that can tell where it's been demonstrated where we can see whether you are thinking of a person or a place, et cetera. Now, that could become arbitrarily precise in the future, and it is certainly a, a possible prospect that you could be have your brain scanned and you could uh, find out stuff about yourself that is not obvious upon introspection, but is nevertheless true of your subjectivity and is, is formative of your subjectivity. So, and, and there are, actually, you don't even need brain scanning technology to discover this. Uh, we know that uh, if, if you are shown that, that a pattern of kind of a racist judgment can be detected in virtually everyone, and certainly virtually everyone who thinks they don't have a racist bone in their body. I mean, if you show people, white people, pictures of, of white and black faces, they're going to much more readily associate negative terms to black faces than white faces. And this is something that, that it, they're, they're uh, uh, psychophysical paradigms that make it just impossible to correct for this, and you are just embarrassingly slower to associate positive terms to another race. And everyone comes out of these experiments mortified, but it's, it's it just, in fact, true of you. Now, you could, you could take that further and have your brain scanned and uh, find out, you know, how much do you love your wife? You know, you could be shown pictures of your wife and think about your wife, and then you could, be, you could think about your last wife, and, uh, <laughs> I, and, and some rather mortifying comparisons could be done there uh, that you wouldn't uh, want to talk about, perhaps. So this is... Insofar as, uh, and again, there could be some limit we would run up against with the technology. It could just be so, as a, as a physical fact, that, that we will only be able to discriminate uh, 
our, we'll only be able to correlate our subjective states with our neurophysiology only so closely. But I think mind reading uh, machines uh, uh, are a real possibility in, in the future. Some people would find this prospect very frightening, very alarming. Yeah. I, think. Um, I mean, I think one of the most spectacular examples is the evidence that decisions are taken in our nervous system before we consciously know it. So yeah. when, when yeah. we decide to, t to do something, little do we know that several seconds earlier we've already decided, um, yeah. which is another yeah. example of, of where science can actually get inside our minds better than we can, so to speak. Yeah. And th that actually torpedoes the whole notion of, of free will. Uh, I, I think you actually don't need a notion of free will in order to have a, a, a notion of moral truth. And this is something that is, is very counterintuitive to people. But we know free will is a non-starter philosophically and scientifically. Now, many people struggle not to admit this, but however our mental life is caused, it is caused either by prior causes or by some randomness intruding. But the, whether it's purely deterministic or there's determinant causes combined with some randomness, neither offer a, a, a space for free will to operate. I mean, just imagine if all of your experience were caused by someone at a computer just, just determining what you feel and do and say and want. Um, that's clearly not a circumstance of, of free will. Now imagine if that person just was determining in all of that, but 10% but, but of the time threw some dice or introduced some other mode of randomness into the process. That doesn't open up a space for free will. And we know, just as a matter of scientific fact, that everything you're consciously intending to do and wanting to do and, think, and judging to be good or bad is preceded by neural events of which you're not conscious uh, and of which you are not the author. You are, we, we, we walk through life feeling that we're the conscious author of our thoughts, but you, don't think of, you can't think a thought before you think it. So, so, so here's a, an experiment in free will. Think of, think of a famous person. So do you have a famous person in mind? Well, why didn't you think of another famous person? I mean, you can't, you can't account for, if you thought of Ricky Gervais, you can't account for why you didn't think of Eddie Izzard. And that, that goes for every other move you might make that, that's starkly voluntary. You are, is, things simply spring into consciousness. Now, the reason why this is not morally important is what we condemn in other people is, is not the fact that they really are the, the, the ground cause of their actions. What we condemn are our intentions to do harm. And intentions are still part of the causal uh, framework. I mean, I, I, I only reach for this water because I, I intend to reach for it. I want, I want to drink it. Um, it's not like I can just sit back and wait and see what happens. And the only way to get to the water is to intend to, to drink it. Uh, and so what we condemn in, in an evil murderer is not the fact that he truly and really and metaphysically is the source of his action. I mean, all these evil murderers have either bad genes or bad parents or bad lives or bad ideas or some combination thereof, and they're not the author of any of those things. Uh, but we still need to lock them up. If, when, you go, when you go to death row and you interview the sociopath and you ask him, what, is, what are you going to do when you get out? And he says, I'm just going to keep raping and killing people. That makes, should make it pretty clear that you want to keep him in there. Uh, but we would keep earthquakes and hurricanes in prison if we could, uh, and we would never think they're evil earthquakes or evil uh, hurricanes. And that's uh, and so there's some things would change about our, our notion of, of, of retribution, say. But the idea that we would have to lock up uh, killers is is uh, not one of them. I think some people will feel quite queasy about that. It, I, yeah. I think it's it's extremely interesting, and no doubt questions will arise. I just got one final point to make. I get a, a much less queasy, but a little bit queasy, about um, completely junking the is-ought distinction in the following sense. Um, people think that because I wrote a book called The Selfish Gene, mm. I'm advocating selfishness. And um, so my stock reply to that is, of course, the is-ought distinction. And I presume you would subscribe to that in the sense that 
Um, we do not wish to say that because something is, quote, natural, that oh, because yeah. something yeah. is out there in nature, that therefore that makes it good. And, and obviously you're not advocating that, but that is sometimes what people mean by the is-ought distinction. You're me meaning something much more subtle. Uh, but I just want to throw that in that, that I yeah, wouldn't wish to yeah. throw the, the is-ought distinction out in that sense. Well, it, the, the idea that, that natural could somehow equate to good. Natural that, that equate to good, yeah, so we all ought right. to go around with no clothes on. I mean, that, that, right. that kind of thing. Right. Uh, obviously, there's, there are, are many propensities we have that are, uh, are, we've evolved to have, which we are busily trying to get rid of or overcome and we're wise to. And that's, um, I mean, there's, a, there's I, at some point in the book, I delineate three different projects, which I don't think we should confuse. The first project is to understand how we came to be the way we are, and this is very much your project of just evolutionary science, we had to have an account of how we came to be primates who, who have morally salient uh, emotions like disgust, say. Uh, and that's, that's a story for evolutionary biology and psychology. But there's, a, there's another project, which is we can figure out how we can experience the greatest well-being based on w how conscious states arise in the brain and, and how, the, how they're impacted by uh, the world. And that's a very different project. That, that, breaks, that, that flies free of the perch that has been built for us by evolution. I mean, that's, that's where we can talk about uh, how to raise compassionate children, despite the fact that, and, and how we would, could change the genome to be more compassionate if, if such a thing is possible. The question of whether all of that is possible is very different from, from the question of how we got here. And the third project is just, is just to convince people to drop all of the, the moral commitments that, that lead to unnecessary human misery. And that's a, that's a, that's a political and, and uh, it's a project of persuasion. And that is uh, also distinct. And they often get conflated. I think we should um, open it up for questions. Um, so I was wondering how the moral landscape feeds back on science. And one way it feeds back on science is it makes intelligible <clears throat> the claim that certain truths about the universe may be best left unknown. I mean, it's, 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 qu it's quite possible that there is intrinsically damaging knowledge given what we are. Say, I mean, the, the, the certain knowledge that human beings, w w it would be, w it'd be rational not to have this knowledge if we could foresee the consequences of having it. And I think we all understand this and agree to it intuitively. I mean, we're not committed to just the maximum dissemination of information. I and mean, we're not busily teaching everyone how to synthesize smallpox. You know, it's not, we, we don't want to make, just make sure everyone has these facts in hand. Um, and it's rational not to, to uh, uh, want to spread that around. And I think we could find ourselves in an area of science where, um, the downside of knowing certain facts, or, or certainly knowing how to, to act on certain facts, technologically speaking, uh, if foreseeable, these things are almost never foreseeable, but uh, if foreseeable, or in hindsight, we would say it would be better if we didn't uh, pursue that. And this is something that Dan Dennett has spoken about a little bit. Um, that's intelligible to me. Now you're going to get the people who say, no, 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 I just want to know everything, and my well-being is predicated on knowing everything. Um, and I'm just not going to be happy if we don't know everything. Uh, that, I think, is very likely not an honest claim. Uh, and if you start looking at it, I mean, you just have to keep raising the stakes of the downside for that person to back off that claim, I think. You don't want to know everything if it's going to mean the, 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 uh, the world is going to be plunged into internecine horror for a century. Uh, so I, I hope that dealt with the spirit of your question. First of all, I agree with your framework, and I admire the way that you've attempted to build it up. However, I think in order to move forward, in order to make it practical, you need to overcome the classical problem of subjectivity, mm -hmm. um, which is that you know one person's experience is their experience, and how do you then make judgments about that in relation to other people? And I was wondering what your opinion was on what science can say about that, with things like functional MRIs revealing more about ourselves, do you think that, that holds um, an area for progress in being able to make a framework like the one you've outlined practical for moral judgments in the real world? Yeah, well, th this is the, this concern really visits us 
everywhere in, in the sciences of mind. This, how is it that you can study human subjectivity and make objective claims about first-person facts? There's, there's a lot of confusion around this I issue of subjectivity versus objectivity, and because we, we use these words in, in two distinct ways, in, in an epistemological way, which describes how we think of reason about the world, and in an ontological way, in terms of what there just is to be reasoned about. And clearly, we can reason and speak and think ob objectively about subjective facts. And we do this all the time in psychology and neuroscience. We can talk about depression. We can talk about what it's like to be you. Uh, we can talk about you know, whether you feel the pain in your right knee or your left knee. These are, these are subjective facts. These are first-person facts. And yet, you don't have to be self-deceived or illogical or merely led by wishful thinking to talk. I mean, these are not merely, uh, these, are in, these are in the purview of science. Now, it's always a, 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 a tricky experimental question just how much you can take somebody's word for their experience. I and mean, we're not incorrigible judges of our experience. We, we can be wrong. We can be self-deceived. We can, we can, you can put me in an experiment where I think I'm choosing something based on my uh, uh, you know, previous history of, of liking you know, red versus blue, say. But I have been primed unconsciously by the experimenters to choose uh, what I chose. And I have absolutely no subject, subjective insight into it. And yet it is actually, we can prove, the cause of my, my behavior. So people can be wrong about their, their subjectivity. And, and I think we can be wrong about just not, not just the unconscious uh, sources of it, but we can actually be wrong about its character. We can just be bad witnesses to what it's like to be us in, in, the, context of, in the context of consciousness. And, and consciousness, therefore, is trainable. We can, we can learn to make discriminations that, that are more refined. It's a gent, but if it's a problem for morality, it is a problem for every scientific study of, of every state of consciousness, psychology and cognitive neuroscience. You mentioned consequentialism. Um, do you think that's a sufficient basis for morality? I do if you, if you revise it the way I, I have attempted to. Um, I think co consequences are what matter. So when you bring forward a traditional retort to consequentialism, like deontology, or like you know, Kant's categorical imperative, that, that, that only makes sense as a moral uh, framework if, in fact, its consequences are good. If you, if you have consequences that are, are obviously horrible, it would no longer count as a rule for morality. And so, too, with a Rawlsian analysis of, of uh, justice, say. Now, if, you, if you're going to go with Rawls and say that, that justice, it's not well-being that we care about. It's, it's justice or fairness, say. Well, give me a world that, is, that maximizes justice but which leads to the needless misery of millions. I mean, if the perfectly just world, the perfectly fair world, immiserates millions who, if you, if you turn the dial of fairness just a little bit, wouldn't suffer in that way, well, then you want to turn that dial. It only, it only, it only counts as, as a moral precept because we recognize, I think rightly, that fairness and justice are, are, are hugely beneficial to us, and we all, pro we all tend to profit from a system in which, which fairness and justice rank very high in, in our, on our list of moral concerns. But I think the cash value is always the consequences in terms of what, what I'm calling well-being. And again, well-being is like health. It can keep absorbing the next thing we care about. If you come forward and say, no, no, you don't understand. There's this other thing that's so important that you're neglecting to, to consider, its importance is always going to going to show up in terms of positive changes in, in the conscious states of, of any conscious creature that could experience that thing. Yeah. This last hour has been a lot of fun to listen to because we've been engaging in what seems like a very thoughtful, fruitful, intelligent exercise in secular moral reasoning, which is an important thing to do. But I think why we all came here is because you seem to be claiming to do something much, much more interesting than that. Namely, that uh, you could appeal to science to say something that's objectively true about morality, right. rather than simply use science as a way to feed us facts into the normal secular moral reasoning that we'd all like to think we could engage in. 
Yet when you put down the philosophical cornerstone of your case, you seem to appeal to common sense, sort of low-hanging fruit. Wouldn't everybody say it's objectively wrong or it's really bad, as you put it, when, when you sort of qualify your statement? Wouldn't you say it's bad to throw acid on someone's face? We'd all say it's bad, but that's not the philosophically interesting case that you were mm. uh, proposing to make. So um, it seems like you may be caught between either making a common sense argument on the one hand or an inability to define your position in a strong sense on the other hand. How are you making that really interesting claim that we can turn to science to tell us what's objectively morally true without simply referring to the low-hanging fruit of throwing acid on people's faces and so on? Yeah, a good question. Uh, well, the moment you grant that we're talking about well-being, uh, that we're right to talk about well-being, we can't conceive of, of something else to talk about in this space, uh, then all of the facts that determine well-being become the, the facts of science, because, because well-being is emerging out of, of the laws of nature in some way. Our conscious states are constrained quite clearly by the laws of nature, whatever they turn out to be. If they entail ectoplasm rising off the brain at death and going to the Christian hell, we're still talking about the way the universe is, and, so, and that would have to fall into, into the purview of some completed science. Now, obviously, there's no reason to believe in any of that. So you could ask a question like, just how important is compassion, say? I mean, what, what is compassion? Is it, what, is, what is the genetic basis for compassion? Is there a, um, what are the practices and uses of attention and institutions that, that, that allow compassion to thrive or, or diminish it? And if there's a trade-off, I mean, just how important is compassion and how, if we have a, a tension between compassion and bureaucratic efficiency, say, what is the right balance there. Now, again, these are all the, the, the details, the level of brains and the level of lived experience are incredibly complicated. If you get to, to conditions where it's just not at all clear which way to go, you're, you're getting to conditions where figuring out which way to go is, in detail would be incredibly complicated, it, it, much more complicated than economics, and economics is, is still struggling to be a science. But I mean, nobody, so, so clearly, we don't understand economic systems with any uh, uh, real success at this point. We can keep being blindsided by how they behave, but nobody doubts that there are right and wrong ways to respond to a, a global banking catastrophe, say. And um, I think to, 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 to carve out a space of truth, of real truth, a space where we recognize there are truth claims to be made about good and evil, or truth claims to be made about economics, all we have to acknowledge are the easy cases. I mean, that's why I appeal to the easy cases, because it's like, it's, you know, with economics, we, we, there, uh, economists can disagree about how to respond to uh, uh, a global economic crisis. It's, the, the science is such, and the, and the complexity of the system under analysis is such that we may never be confident about the right answer, but we know there are wrong answers. If, 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 an econ if someone got on CNN and said, well, I've got the solution, let's just destroy all material wealth. Let's just have a huge potlatch where we just burn buildings and ruin everything. Okay, that's, and then we'll have to build it again, and that's a brilliant idea. It's going to put everyone to work. Okay, that's pretty clearly the wrong answer. Now, so we, know, so we know there are better, we know there are right and wrong answers. We know there are ways to fail where your beliefs can be erroneous, and that's that's, um, I'm arguing this is, if it's true for, for something like economics, it's also true for morality. If we assume that religion is the only source of morality, and as a solution to that, and we agree there's problems with that, and as a solution to that, if we offer science as the counter source of truth, are we not sort of just advocating supplementing one canon of truth at one level by another? as opposed to which, as Professor Dawkins said, wouldn't the better solution be to advocate a scientific process of reasoning as a better means of achieving at morality than at science as a source of morality? So don't you think the focus of science should be on advocating an increased acceptance of scientific reasoning than as science in itself as a canon of truth? Yeah, I, I don't think you can keep those two apart, though. I mean, when we're advocating scientific reasoning, when we're advocating having your, your convictions scale with evidence and, and, and cogent arguments, then we are of necessity 
attacking religion, or so people like Richard and myself argue. I mean, there is a zero-sum conflict between believing things for good reasons and believing things for bad reasons. And so that's, that <laughs> distinction is already intrusive of people's sanctities. And uh, insofar as we make any kind of mature progress in the sciences of mind, we are just of necessity going to be divulging truths about human well-being that will be scientifically true and ac actionable. It's just, it's, it's, it's just, just as, just as science comes forward and says at some point, listen, smoking is a cause of lung cancer. You know, you shouldn't do it. If you, if you, if you, if you care about avoiding lung cancer, d don't smoke. Um, that's not an Orwellian, intrusive, guys in white lab coats, you know, the morality police grabbing you. That is, that is just information which is, which is now actionable. And, the, and there are conditions where it becomes coercive. I mean, we, it's, it's, if you let your children smoke, if you're giving cigarettes to a three-year-old, you are a bad parent, and the, and the state has an interest in preventing you from doing that to your child. Um, and there could be analogous discoveries in just how we, we can, uh, can thrive in a, in a moral domain. I mean, in the United States, 20, 20 of the 50 states have made it legal, or it's, it's still legal, it's long been legal, to beat children in their schools with a, with, a, you know, with a significant wooden paddle. I mean, not just a rap on the knuckles, but actually, you know, a, a strange man comes up and, and beats your child with a wooden board. Um, this is legal, in, and, and hundreds of thousands of children every year are beaten, sometimes bloody, by their teachers not with the consent of their parents. I mean, and this is, this is a, and this, needless to say, is all anchored to, to religion and, and, and uh, you know, proverbs, you know, not to spare the rod on the child. And fr from the point of view of psychological science, this is not good. This is not good for children. Uh, and and a certain, we may not know that, that now uh, at the level of data in a way that's utterly compelling or it can be made utterly compelling but it's not, if we know anything if we discover anything at all about how children can can develop healthily in, in a cognitive and emotional sense at some point it's going to be like smoking causes lung cancer uh, and that will be by definition intrusive into uh, uh, people's it won't be just a matter of reasoning it'll be a matter of of science saying what is good for us I once uh, saw a film of a child, I think in the New Guinea Highlands, that was at the mother's breast. It had a cigarette in its hand, taking alternate drags at the breast right. and at the cigarette. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would like to ask a question of clarification between the relationship between philosophy and science. Um, you know, reading your book, it's clear that you haven't committed what many critics have said is you've committed Hume's fallacy and a naturalistic fallacy. But given what you've said tonight, there's some ambiguity and possible inconsistency in what you're saying. Um, I mean, one statement you said that all, science have, all sciences have philosophical presuppositions. Mm. And in a later statement, you said that there really wasn't a distinction between mm. philosophy and science. I think those are the same statement. Right. I mean, that, that's, that, at least to my ear, they're the same statement. But, I mean, the foundational principle of what you're saying, I mean, and I do agree with you, um, well, uh, of ethics as well being, I mean, you get that from philosophical argument. You get that from reason and reflection and deliberation. You do not get that from observation or experiment. But if you were to get that from observation and experiment, then you would be committing Hume's fallacy. You would be deriving it not from an is. Philosophy is, is intrinsically normative. I mean, could you just sort of clarify the relationship between science and philosophy? Well, it's, it's a claim about truth. It's a claim about, about what exists, whether or not we know it. Now, that is, that is the frame in which we do all science and all philosophy. And, and it only becomes science when you can describe the experiment that you would do. This isn't actually even entirely true, because there's a lot of physics that seems to go on in the absence of a conceivable experiment for quite some time. But physics gives us a picture of the world, say, this is, you know, the, uh, the many worlds thesis of, you know, there, there are multiple universes, say, that could have, uh, 
uh, copies of ourselves living out different lives. Say. That's a, a physical claim based on some data, but you can't, we don't have an experiment that's going to resolve that now or perhaps ever. Um, and yet it's a picture of reality that, that has scientific bona fides. It's a description of what exceeds our, our immediate purview. I'm saying the same can be said about the possibilities of experience. The same, it's, it's just there are conscious experiences available based on what consciousness is and the laws of nature. And this captures everything we can conceivably mean by right and wrong and good and evil, as witnessed by the fact that if you imagine the worst possible suffering for everyone, that is clearly the, 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 the ground out of which all, uh, against which all negative moral judgments can be, be measured. And so I, don't, I, don't, I just don't see the split. I think we're, we've learned to split science and philosophy. Uh, we've learned to split facts and values in our language, and I, I think it's, we're being misled by language. I think we have the space of truth claims, possible truth claims, about which we form beliefs, and our beliefs can be uh, justified to a better or worse degree. I just apologize that we haven't had time to have more, but uh, thank you very much. I think, I'm sure we'd all like to thank Sam. Thank you very much. Thank you.